U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power, both strategically and intellectually. The following Issues in National Security Lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Good afternoon, everyone joining us here in Spruance and out there via electrons. My name is Tim Schultz. I am the Associate Dean of Academics, and I have the high honor today of introducing our guest speaker in the Issues in National Security Lecture Series. It is Professor John Jackson, the one and only John Jackson. He has the coolest job title in all of the Naval War College. He is the Elmer A. Sperry Chair of Robotics and Unmanned Systems. No better title uh, or job than that. He also has the coolest office, swing by there someday, and it is this modern day diorama of, of robots and science fiction memorabilia and models and all kinds of things. And if you go downstairs to the Future Forces Gallery, which John Jackson built, you'll also see another diorama that you can marvel at, a diorama of the, uh, the modern age. So check that out. I am privileged to work very uh, frequently with John because he co-teaches one of our premier electives. All of our electives are premier, but this one has endured. It's one of the few that is taught more than once a year. It's the Unmanned Systems in Conflict in the 21st Century elective. Uh, students flock to it super relevant. John has testified to Congress about this elective and about how military officers perceive innovation. Uh, so he is a, a, a force here at the Naval War College. And John is what arson investigators would describe as an accelerant. John makes things happen. He is a catalyst here at the Naval War College. He doesn't burn things down, he builds things up. He, he is a creator of things. Uh, not only did he help establish this national security uh, lecture series, he also serves as the program manager for the Chief of Naval Operations Professional Reading Program. Uh, he does a lot of special event work for the president of the Naval War College. Uh, if something good is happening at the Naval War College, there are probably John Jackson's fingerprints on it somehow, somewhere. Uh, he does a lot of work in the College of Distance Education as well. He's particularly well qualified for today's topic, and Exhibit A is his book, One Nation Under Drones, and Exhibit B is the same book, One Nation Under Drones, only published in Chinese recently by Taiwan's Ministry of Defense. His work has gone global and to a place uh, of uh, particular interest here in Newport as well. He is becoming known, not just here, but far beyond these walls as the avatar of AI, the baron of bots, the Caesar of cyborgs, the Duke of drones. I personally refer to him as a weapon of mass instruction. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor John Jackson.
It's always nice to have your office mate uh, who lives next to you do the introduction because he knows where most of the skeletons are buried and whatnot. So uh, it uh, is a great pleasure to be here. I'm uh, wearing my official One Nation Under Drones merchandise, which I'll be selling out of the trunk of my Corvette uh, after the show here tonight. So uh, what we're going to do is a presentation I've done before. Uh, if you've seen it before, I apologize because the jokes haven't changed, but some of the content in the speech has. So uh, we're going to talk about robots that fly, swim, and crawl. Oh, this way. Point that way. How are we doing? Dean, let me see. There, forward. All right, there we go. I've got it. Okay, uh, bottom line is you can't pick up a magazine, a newspaper, or anything else and not find something about drones and robotics and how they're going to change the way the world operates, how we all uh, do our day-to-day -day business and how America and the rest of the world uh, are going to fight. So as always, we ask, is this a new idea? And what we find out is, no, it, it really isn't. If you look back in history, this is the Sperry automatic airplane. Uh, it was designed towards the end of the First World War. And the uh, theory here was you would take that airplane, no pilot, you'd load it with explosives, you'd point it in the general di direction of the target, it would take off, and as it flew, it would count the number of times the propeller went around. When it got to a preset number, the engine would cut off and it would dive on the target. Not exactly precision-guided munitions, but uh, fundamentally it, uh, it got the job done. And this is a uh, model of the aircraft, and you can see that down in the Future Forces Gallery, as uh, Tim mentioned. So that was towards the end of the First World War. Uh, radio control then came along, and people decided that was a better way to do it than just kind of ballistically uh, throwing the weapon on the uh, enemy. And so in the early days of uh, World War II, there was an airplane called the Denny Mite. Now, there was an uh, actor named Reginald Denny. Ask your grandmother, she might know who Reginald Denny was. He was an actor, but he was also interested in radio-controlled aircraft. And if you're a cannoneer, if you're a, a gun uh, uh, officer, a gunnery officer on a ship, you've got to practice your trade. And what they traditionally would do would be to fly an airplane with what they call a sleeve towed behind it, and the gunners would shoot at the sleeve. I say again, shoot at the sleeve, not shoot at the airplane. Uh, occasionally they did lose some of those aircraft, and so Reginald Denny and others said, well, maybe there's a way we could use a radio-controlled airplane either as the target that they would actually shoot at or would tow the sleeve. Over 7,000 of these Denny mites were built during the uh, Second World War and uh, used very effectively for training. Well, there was an Army captain by the name of Ronald Reagan who was in the public affairs business, and he heard about these things, and he uh, knew that the factory existed in Southern California. So he sent a photographer out to uh, look into the situation and found this young woman, uh, attractive young woman, who was building drones. Now, they looked and they took some pictures and they said, you know, she probably could do more than build drones. And so that's Marilyn Monroe. So this is the ultimate bar bet, you know, if you're hanging around a bar and somebody says, how did Marilyn Monroe get her start? She got her start building drones. Now, there's a vicious rumor that Lady Gaga is getting into the drone business. And if that's true, I'm getting out of the drone business. But uh, anyway, so let's uh, jump ahead here. And what we're going to do with uh, the systems primarily is we're going to talk about aerial systems, maritime systems, land systems, and talk a little bit about uh, some of the civilian uses and whatnot. So let's jump first into the aerial systems. And one you may have heard about is the Global Hawk. This is the largest unmanned system that the U.S. operates. And it is a surveillance aircraft. It does not carry a weapon. But it has the capability to, in effect, fly from California to uh, Maine, spend six or seven hours surveying what goes on, and then fly back to California. That's the kind of range and endurance it has. Operated by a crew primarily out of uh, Sacramento, California. And so the Global Hawk has been incredibly successful in terms of providing that uh, overwatch and that surveillance for what needs to be seen so that we know what the enemy's up to. 
Well, the U.S. Navy looks and says, you know, we have an awful lot of territory that we'd like to uh, surveil as well. And so this is the MQ-4C Triton. This is the uh, Navy's version of Global Hawk, if you will, and it's designed to fly over open ocean and surveil what's going on. You can see the aircraft carrier down at the bottom there. It does not take off from an aircraft carrier. It does not land on an aircraft carrier. It's far too large to do that. So it's a land-based maritime patrol aircraft. And it is intended to operate with the P-8 maritime patrol aircraft, which is a manned aircraft. So Triton can go out for 24 to 36 hours at a time. If they see a target, then they can contact the P-8s. P-8s have the ability to come much quicker onto station, investigates what's going on, and can carry weapons and attack that target if necessary. So the combination between the Triton and the P-8 uh, has been very, very successful. This is me uh, at uh, Point Magoo in California. And uh, what you may not realize, and it's hard to tell when I'm at the podium here, but I'm six foot seven tall. And who's laughing back there? Now, I'm gonna prove it to you. So there it is, this is me. And this is one of my uh, fellow professors, uh, uh, also worked in Game of Thrones. But uh, as you can see, I am clearly at least six and a half feet tall. So we will use myself as a ruler as we talk about the size of some of these vehicles going forward. So the next one that uh, you may have heard about as well is the MQ-9 Reaper. Uh, originally, we operated the Predator, which was a man, an unmanned, armed, long-endurance drone and it was originally designed for surveillance and they were flying one time, looked down, saw a group of people all gathered around a very tall individual wearing a turban and whatnot and the uh, people watching the screen said, I think that's uh, Osama bin Laden. By the time they got an aircraft down to uh, attack the target, they dispersed and they were gone. So the question was, well, could we fire a missile or drop a bomb from an unmanned aircraft and not rip the wings off? And so they decided to attempt it. They found out they were very successful in using Hellfire missiles and gravity bombs. This is a shot uh, in uh, uh, Creech Air Force Base in Nevada. And uh, they have a hole in the ground they make the Navy guys stand in so the Air Force guys look a lot taller. At least that's my story. But uh, this is a, uh, a, a Predator Reaper with uh, bombs under the wings and whatnot, and uh, a couple of the uh, commanders of that activity. So the uh, interesting thing about the Predator and Reaper craft are they operate in theater somewhere, whether it's Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Africa, wherever the case may be. The pilot is in some other location in the continental United States and is flying that thing via electronics. And so if he is in Creech Air Force Base outside Las Vegas, or in about 25 other locations around the United States, he can fly that aircraft, the sensor operator sees what's going on, and they can uh, surveil and, if necessary, attack the target. So it's interesting because it allows a, an, a pilot to sit in the seat, fly for eight hours, get up, replaced by a second pilot, flies for another eight hours, third shift comes in, continues to fly, then you have to land the airplane, refuel it, and send it back up again. But the airplane stays in theater throughout the uh, entire period of time. So this is called remote split operations, and it's been very, very successful. Uh, the Air Force was operating up to 75 of the Predators and Reapers, at any point in time. So 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they could have 75 aircraft in the air doing the job. And that wasn't enough. The uh, demand was even greater than any of that. So very, very successful program. It's uh, scaling back a bit. And uh, the next generation of aircraft is going to be uh, designed to be able to operate in a higher threat environment. Uh, because if you're flying an area against Chinese or other targets, you're uh, potentially going to need to be able to uh, be much stealthier and be able to potentially defend yourself. So the next generation of uh, unmanned aircraft will be somewhat different. Which brings us to uh, this version. 
Now again, the Navy said we'd like to get unmanned aircraft on aircraft carriers. The Triton, far too big, but this is the UCAS, the Unmanned Combat Air Systems Demonstrator, uh, which is able to take off and land from an aircraft carrier. And the decision was that uh, there is the indication of the size of the vehicle. And so the thought was, well, is it going to be an attack aircraft? Is it going to be a surveillance aircraft? What is its primary mission going to be? The determination by Navy was what we needed more than anything else was an air-to-air -air refueler. And so that is what the, uh, the MQ-25 Alpha Stingray has now been developed. In this case, you're seeing the uh, refueling aircraft passing fuel, passing gas, which they say, to the unmanned aircraft. But uh, in the future, it's going to be done in reverse order. So this is the uh, MQ-25 Alpha Stingray, and it is a carrier-based air-to-air refueler. And here you see it in the air refueling a, uh, an aircraft. So the notion here is you're going to have an organic capability on the deck of the aircraft carrier. Right now, the U.S. Navy uses F&A 18 aircraft fighter and attack aircraft that carry fuel pods and do air-to-air -air refueling. It's not a very efficient way to do business. We're burning up their fighter and attack aircraft doing a important but uh, less critical refueling mission. So Navy's decision is we're gonna buy this air-to-air -air refueler and that's what you see here. Uh, Boeing has flown their test version, which you're seeing there in that photo, and uh, construction of the uh, fleet of the, uh, the Stingrays is currently underway, and we hope to see those on board ships within the next 18 to 24 months. This is the, uh, the Sentinel, the RQ-170 Sentinel, and this is a stealth surveillance aircraft. Uh, it was known as the Beast of Kandahar in the days when it was flying uh, secretly uh, in Afghanistan. And you may have seen uh, the Iranians claim to have shot down one of these, and you may have seen it on display in Iranian photos. We did lose an aircraft. Uh, we don't think it was shot down. We think it had electronics problems uh, and then flew until it ran out of fuel and glided into the desert where the Iranians were able to pick it up and whatnot. So we don't believe that we lost a lot in terms of uh, security from uh, the loss of the RQ-170. And uh, this is at an unclassed level, and that's how we teach our course also at the unclassed level. But uh, in the uh, public press, you see discussion of the follow-on stealth version of an aircraft such as this. If you remember the uh, Osama bin Laden raid uh, in Abbottabad, and you've seen the famous picture of President Obama and Secretary Clinton and others watching the raid take place, they were watching video feed coming from these uh, one of these RQ-170 Sentinels. So very, very successful aircraft, and we will see them operating in a lot of different ways in the future. So let's shrink down a little bit smaller. This is the Marine Corps Blackjack. And there again is an indication of the size. And the notion here is the Marines have said, you know, we're operating somewhere. We could ask can the Air Force, could you send a Reaper up by or send a, a uh, Global Hawk by and let me know what's going on in the battlefield? Maybe they will, maybe they not. It depends on what the uh, requirement is. So the Marines have said, we want to have our own aircraft that we take with us and we operate and we task it for what it needs to do and when it needs to do it. So this is the Blackjack. Uh, it's uh, built... Uh, uh, a civilian version of it, uh, very similar to the uh, uh, Scan Eagle, which you can see flying in the uh, Future Forces Gallery. But uh, it is operating, and again, it's a surveillance platform. They've strapped some bombs under it. No matter what it is, we'll put a bomb under it and see if we can get it to operate. But primarily, it is a surveillance platform that's trying to let you know what's on the other side of that hill before you have to go over there and fight. This is, uh, again, smaller. So this is AeroVironment switchblade. And they call it a switchblade because the wings pop out, the tail pops out after it leaves its launcher. And you can see the trooper there looking in the control uh, 
uh, system and flying this thing. It'll fly for about 25 minutes. You direct it where you want to go. And the interesting thing about this uh, unmanned aerial vehicle is it has a warhead and you don't want this one to come back. When it launches, you're not gonna bring it back and reuse it, it's a one-time use device. And if for some reason you do not have a target that you want to strike, then you'll go ahead and drive it into the ground and, uh, and destroy it. So uh, there's a larger version of the uh, uh, switchblade, which I'll talk about uh, in a few minutes. It's currently being used in Ukraine. Another version of the same aircraft is called the Black Wing. And this is used by the U.S. Submarine Force. And what the Submarine Force will do is come to periscope depth, launch the Black Wing, wings pop out, and it gives them basically a 2,000 foot tall periscope. So they can see everything that's going on in the area in which they're operating. Uh, when they're finished with it, goes in the water. They do not make any attempt to recover it, uh, but the price point is such that it's, uh, it's efficient and, and effective in doing that. So submarine force really likes, you know, staying stealthy and knowing what's going on around them, and the Blackwing gives them that capability. Talk about another program which is uh, in the design phase right now, and they call this the Loyal Wingman. And the notion here is what if you have a manned aircraft, whether it's an F-35 or an F-22 or whatever the case may be, uh, what if you could fly the manned aircraft and flying alongside is four to six loyal wingmen who are flying with them and under control of that pilot. And the loyal wingmen are carrying additional weapons or they're carrying jamming devices and they will go across the beach and jam the systems as necessary. So a lot of work being done on loyal wingmen. Uh, the Australians are uh, building one right now in uh, conjunction with Boeing. And so I think what you're gonna see is manned, unmanned teaming. It's kind of the buzzword. Uh, you'll find that the drones are not replacing pilots. In some cockpits, they're replacing them, but the pilots are still going to have plenty to do uh, in the, uh, the manned aircraft and perhaps controlling other aircraft. This is a uh, fascinating program called Gremlins. And uh, the notion is if you have a small unmanned aircraft, they don't really have tremendously long range. So the idea is what if you could load a cargo aircraft C-130, C-5, C-17, with a whole bunch of these aircraft. You throw them out the back end of the aircraft, and they fly in and do whatever mission you want them to do, jamming, attack, whatever the case may be. And then they return and are captured in midair by the capturing aircraft, winched back inside, flown back to base, fueled up, taken back up, and used again. So uh, they have done this experimentally. Uh, we said that air-to-air -air refueling is a very demanding task. Well, this is air-to-air -air capture of another airframe, and uh, we believe this has got great potential for providing the legs that you need to get close into the targets that you're going to want to attack. I mentioned Ukraine, and so we'll just touch briefly on uh, this is uh, Iranian drones, the Shahid-136. And the Iranians have sold a large number of these to the Russians, who are using them to significant effect in Ukraine. They are long range. They are, you know, 1,500 miles or better. They carry a relatively small warhead, uh, about 60 to 100 pound warhead. They're not terribly accurate, but they're accurate enough to do what needs to be done. And they cost about $20,000 a copy. So that's incredibly cheap. And so these things are being purchased and used in the hundreds and used to attack targets in the Ukraine. This is the uh, Bayraktar. Uh, this is a Turkish built drone, which the Ukrainians are using to great effect. And again, they use them for surveillance. Uh, what they'll do with some of these drones is they will fly at night. They'll look down and they'll find Russian tanks that have pulled over on the side of the road and stopped for the evening. 
and is, they're still radiating heat to the point where the drone can pick up that uh, heat signature and direct a weapon, uh, either artillery or another drone, onto that target. So uh, great success. The Ukrainians are very, very uh, uh, clever folks in what they're doing and have uh, caused tremendous damage to the, uh, to the Russian forces, as you have uh, read. This is the Switchblade 600. So we talked earlier about the Switchblade 300, small warhead. This is the Switchblade 600, which is a much larger warhead, longer range, can fly for you know hour and a half at a time, carry a bigger, bigger warhead. And so these are being manufactured and shipped to Ukraine and basically as quickly as we can. And they're fundamentally easy to operate. One of the issues has been the Ukrainians have said, you know, give us modern fighters so we can uh, fight the Russian Air Force. Learning to fly and operate those aircraft, very difficult. Maintenance is very difficult. So uh, the real sweet spot is potentially using unmanned drones, which are easy to learn how to operate, smart uh, uh, in terms of how they operate. And so that may be the big pick, uh, payoff as opposed to manned aircraft. So these have all been fixed wing, fixed wing aircraft. Uh, we call helicopters rotary wing aircraft. This is a design which uh, this guy apparently doesn't think much of his legs, because if you look, there are dozens of whirling blades uh, flying around, uh, and he's going to land that thing and try and get off at some point. So I'm not sure that's the uh, the best idea or the best design and whatnot, but. There are a number of uh, rotary wing drones. Uh, this is uh, one of the more successful. This is the MQ-8C Fire Scout. And this is a Bell 407 helicopters, helicopter, which are used. There's hundreds of them, if not thousands, all around the world. So what they've done is they've taken the, uh, the Bell 407, they've painted the window gray, put an unmanned operating system in it, and they have used this very successfully both ashore and from uh, uh, ships. And the notion is if you can put this on a ship with a manned helicopter, the robot unmanned helicopter can fly when the other uh, manned aircraft is down and the pilots are taking pilot rest, et cetera. This is uh, a smaller version of, uh, of the uh, Fire Scout and uh, that's me. Uh, once again, I'm wearing my blue shirt. Now, my boss sent me to Las Vegas for a conference, and I took pictures, and I brought them back and showed them to him. And he said, you know, I know what happened here is you went to the conference one day, you went around, took pictures of everything. The rest of the time you spent playing golf or gambling. So the moral of the story is either don't show the pictures to your boss or change your shirt between the various uh, uh, things that you're going to take pictures of. So... This is the Lockheed K-MAX, and this is a fascinating aircraft. Uh, it was originally built as an aerial logger. So the idea is you would f go into an area and you cut down the logs. Well, how do you get the logs out? Do you have to make a logging road at great expense and very demanding on the en environment and whatnot, or could you fly in, pick up the logs, and bring them somewhere for processing? And that's what the uh, K-Max originally was intended to do. It's a 6,000 6, pound airplane that can lift 6,000 pounds. Dual counter-rotating propellers, it's quite a uh, interesting uh, evolution. And so uh, the Marines looked at this and said, you know, uh, we find that when we're trying to maintain a forward operating base, we have to send truckloads of stuff to that forward base. So we have a couple truckloads worth of stuff, then we have a couple truckloads of people protecting the truckloads of stuff, etc. Improvised explosive devices are the biggest single killer of, uh, of our troops uh, in that environment and whatnot. So they said, what if we didn't have to use the roads at all? What if we could pick up the material at a staging base, fly it into the area you want, Marine or soldier on the ground uses a laser pointer and says, drop it here. It carries a carousel of four pallets, and so it can drop a pallet here, then go to another location, drop a pallet, 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 and back. Strictly unmanned, most of the time they flew at night. Very successful, uh, a couple million pounds of cargo moved. 
They uh, sent the device over there for a six month test. It stayed for two and a half years because the Marines said, we're not gonna let it come home until you can replace it with something. So uh, additional design work is being done on this aircraft uh, by a lot of different companies, both Lockheed and other manufacturers. And the question is, you know, to what degree can the US forces afford to buy a logistics unmanned helicopter for doing logistics work. So we'll see as force structure develops how many of these have. But the payback is, is, is truly remarkable. There's even been designs done for casualty evacuation. If you have someone that's injured, do you need to send a manned air, aircraft in to try and pick that person up and potentially lose the crew? If you could send an unmanned helicopter in to pick up that uh, casualty, it might be a, uh, a good idea. So we'll see how that develops. So we're ramping down in size. We're still talking about rotary craft. This is the instant eye quad rotor. Uh, the Marines have a belief that every squad should have their own drones with them. Again, the notion of what's going on on the other side of that hill. So they now have the ability to find that out. And so the uh, quads for squads is a small unmanned uh, helicopter and it can fly and send back live video of what's going on in the, in the area. Smaller yet, the Black Hornet Nano Drone. And this one, you can tell he's holding it in his fingers. It looks like a toy, but it very much is not. It can fly for about 15 minutes. Uh, the troops wear a box on their chest that carries two of these drones in it. They take one out, they throw it in the air, and they control it with a controller, and it flies over to see what's going on inside the compound or wherever else it might be visual only, so it's, it's come sending back data, it's not carrying a weapon of any sort. And then when it comes back, it lands, they send another one out, they recharge that one, and they keep going back and forth. The Special Forces people, both US and uh, Special Air Service and other folks, uh, UK have used these extensively, and so they, uh, they look like a toy, but they uh, very much are not, so. So that's some rotary wing military applications. Let's look uh, at some civilian applications. Now this is the Ehang, a Chinese UAV taxi. Now the design here is it's an unmanned aircraft. You walk up to it, you open the door, you climb in, you take the iPad, you say, take me to Tiverton. You press the button, it takes off and takes you to Tiverton. No pilot, no parachute, just one terrified passenger. And so I don't know if this is gonna work successfully, but there's a lot of people doing a lot of investigation on the concept of uh, aerial taxis. Uber and Lyft are looking extensively at these to say that's the next level of transportation. You know, could you call a helicopter to come pick you up from a rooftop in downtown New York and take you to the airport or take you to wherever you needed to go and whatnot. So. Uh, this is another design. This is the Volocopter, and uh, that's me sitting in it uh, at the Singapore Air Show. And it uh, is a round, circular uh, uh, support facility with electric motors on all those various points and whatnot. And the notion is that it can do the uh, urban uh, mobility mission that uh, people believe needs to be done. Shrinking down even more, this is a, 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 basically a toy drone. There have been hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of uh, hobbyist drones built. This is one that uh, was flown in January of 2015 onto the lawn of the White House. You may have heard about it. Uh, it got a lot of people excited. They're so small, they're hard to detect. They're usually non-metallic, so you really can't see them on radar. So the notion is, how do you stop something like this from uh, uh, attacking the, uh, the White House or anywhere else? And you could put a very small explosive on these if necessary. And that's one of the big concerns for uh, this is swarms. You know, if you have one drone, two drones, a couple coming and whatnot, you theoretically could knock them down. What if you had tens or hundreds or thousands of swarmed drones coming at you at one time? Could you stop them? 
you've probably all seen on the, you know, the Olympics and the Super Bowl and otherwise, up to 2,000 drones in the air at one time making various designs and figures and uh, Disney World is using these uh, as a replacement for fireworks because they can take them and fly them and use them again year, uh, you know, day in and day out. So the whole notion of uh, small groups or even large groups of drones is uh, very, very uh, interesting in a lot of ways. So now this is the best photo of the entire program, so get ready. This is what I call my John Wayne photo. So this is called the Skywall. It's a counter UAS system. And that's me uh, out on the grass in front of Loose Hall uh, shooting down some drones. Now the notion here is if you have drones, quad rotors or uh, you know, octa rotors, however many rotors it has, flying in, how do you stop them? Well, this is a way to use a uh, viewfinder, a uh, search device. You look in the uh, screen there, you put the crosshairs on the drone. When you get to the appropriate place, you press the trigger. Compressed gas shoots a projectile out. When it gets near the drone, the projectile splits open, drops a net onto the drone, and drags it down to the ground. Probably has a parachute, if you choose to, that can help the thing float down. It helps not hit anybody in the head. It also helps you be able to do forensics on the drone and say, where did this thing come from? Uh, perhaps we can uh, find out where it was and stop it. Uh, Skywall also has a permanent designed uh, gun that can sit permanently in place around airports or high value targets and whatnot. Uh, and I've seen photos of it uh, outside Air Force One uh, providing uh, you know, coverage of that, uh, that aircraft. So, so how do you stop these things? This is a kinetic way. This is a way to mechanically knock the drones down. This is uh, called a drone killer, and this is a device that basically uses an electronic signal to either jam the signal that's controlling the drone and uh, force it to go somewhere else or uh, jam it and cause it to crash. The problem with the electronic version is you also jam a lot of other frequencies jam your own communications if it's in a civilian environment. You know, if you're trying to protect the Super Bowl, do you want to knock the network television people off with a uh, digital sing signal and whatnot? So not always the best notion, but a lot of different ways are being tried. They've even gone as far as to try using hawks, and they've uh, trained these birds to go up and catch these things out of midair. So the ASPCA and the other folks say, well, you know, the uh, claws of the birds are going to get hurt if they come in contact with the rotor. So they built little Kevlar gloves to put on the uh, claws of the birds and have used them. So been used a lot in uh, Australia and a lot of other areas. Obviously, uh, you know, a lot of concerns with uh, using uh, animals and how, how that might work, but it has been done. And so uh, if you have an idea how to do the counter UAS, counter unmanned air system uh, business, uh, bring it forward. You can probably make a lot of money. Okay, so that's aerial. Let's jump uh, quickly to uh, maritime. And so... The uh, U.S. Navy has a belief that, uh, you know, we would like to have 350 ships. We're not going to get 350 ships. We can't afford to buy that many. Uh, the uh, Chief of Naval Operations has said potentially we will have 200 manned ships and 100 unmanned ships. And we're looking at a class of small, medium, and large unmanned surface ships. This is the... Uh, the Autonomous Continuous Trail Unmanned Vehicle called Active. It's also known as the Sea Hunter. And uh, there's now a sister ship called the Sea Hawk. And it has operated from San Diego to Hawaii and back totally unmanned. The idea initially was it was going to locate a submarine and then stay on top of that submarine uh, as long as necessary and potentially force the submarine to the surface or at least you're keeping track of where the thing is. 
they said, you know, it can do a lot more than anti-submarine work. And so the Sea Hunter has been used in a number of uh, exercises, rim pack and other exercises, as an example of what an unmanned surface vehicle can do. This is uh, just some uh, artist conceptions of what some unmanned, uh, medium-sized unmanned surface vessels might do. Uh, we'll come back to those and tell you a little bit more about them. We're talking about unmanned undersea vehicles. Uh, a lot of work being done in that area. Uh, that yellow thing is down in the Future Forces Gallery, and this is the design for a uh, unmanned undersea vehicle that would ride on the outside of the submarine, would spin off, go and do its mission, come back, reconnect to the submarine. Uh, there are a lot of versions that uh, will operate out of uh, torpedo tubes. There's a 21 inch limit to the diameter of a torpedo tube. And so if you want something that's bigger than 21 inches, you're gonna have to have a different way to launch it. And potentially you're gonna do that out of uh, vertical launch tubes and a lot of different ways that we might do that. This is out of sequence, but I'll go ahead and talk about this is uh, back to the surface uh, business. So what are you going to do with that large unmanned surface ship? Well, there's a concept uh, some decades ago called the arsenal ship. And what that says is, okay, you've got a modern uh, destroyer cruiser and it'll hold 60 to 100 missiles. Uh, what happens when they're, they shoot all those on the first day of the war, potentially? Well, if you had an arsenal ship with maybe uh, 500 or 1,000 missile tubes traveling with you, you could uh, target the uh, targets that you want to use uh, with the manned platform and then launch the aircraft, launch the missiles from the uh, unmanned surface ship. So a lot of design work, a lot of money uh, potentially going in that. The uh, U.S. Navy is building a shore-based uh, test facility. Uh, you know, the idea is could you take an unmanned ship and operate it for six months without touching it? Pretty demanding. And our friends in Congress have said, uh, you need to prove to us that you can do that. So you build a uh, uh, engineering system on the beach somewhere and you run it for six months and see if you can do it. So US Navy is in fact doing that to uh, do the ex experimental work to see if in fact we can scientifically and technologically design a surface ship that would not have any crew aboard. Now potentially what you do is you'd have flyaway teams on your manned ship and if something broke, you'd fly them to the unmanned ship. Or there's even very, there's concepts for very limited small crews that would ride these ships. But the idea of uh, unmanned, it means unmanned with nobody. This is a, an eye test, but this is uh, unmanned undersea vehicles. This is the one that uh, I find most interesting, and this is the Echo Voyager or the, uh, <clears throat> the Orca program. This is an unmanned submarine. It's 80 feet long, about eight feet in diameter, dives to 11,000 feet depth of water. Not 1,100, but 11,000. And it's truly, truly a remarkable uh, design. This is uh, me at the launching of the, uh, the Echo Voyager, and that one behind me does not have the 34-foot payload section, so it's smaller than the actual one will be. And you see, I'm not wearing my blue shirt, but I put the blue shirt on just in case. So. Here is the actual uh, Echo Voyager. That's me on the, uh, on the beach, and you can see that 34-foot payload section. So the front end is basically sensors. The back end is propulsion at diesel electric. So it carries enough diesel fuel to operate potentially for six months at a time. What does it do? All right, it could launch missiles or UAVs from the top. It can drop mines. It can launch torpedoes from the bottom. It could even swim seals from a deck shelter inside that, air, that uh, submarine. Not from 11,000 feet depth of water, but obviously shallow water. So uh, US Navy, uh, Boeing spent about $150 million developing the Echo Voyager. Uh, of their own money, and you know, it's the old idea, if you build it, they will come. Well, they built it and they experimented with it, and in fact, Navy has now ordered five of these, which are under construction. One test model is currently in the water being operated now. So the U.S. Navy is very interested in this, and uh, you know, we're not gonna have enough submarines to do everything we want. 
Can an unmanned submarine do everything a manned submarine can do? Of course not. But it can do a lot of things, and it can free the manned submarine to do the more demanding mission. So if you take an unmanned submarine like this and you uh, sail it uh, from whatever port you want to operate it from, or you can airload it in a cargo aircraft, in one lift you can move that entire submarine, which weighs about 55 tons. In one lift with a C-5 aircraft, you can launch, land, load it, take it where you need it, offload it, put the three pieces together, use a 50-ton yacht crane to put it in the water, and it swims off and does its thing. So it's a uh, truly remarkable uh, concept, and so we will see them increasingly. And the oil and gas industry, which has more money than DOD, uh, is very interested in these as well, to do uh, uh, pipeline uh, construction, inspection, uh, undersea cable inspection, construction, and whatnot. And so we think that once the U.S. Navy has proven this concept that the uh, civilians will buy some of these. And the U.S. Navy is good with that. You know, we, we wouldn't mind if the Chinese or the Russians don't know whether that's the U.S. Navy down there or that's shell oil. It just complicates the uh, firing solution. So there's some other designs of some of the smaller uh, uh, vehicles. Uh, some are man portable, as you can see there. Some are, uh, uh, you need a crane to use them, but depending on what the application is, uh, these sea gliders and some of these other unmanned aircraft, uh, unmanned submersibles uh, can do all kinds of work. This is one uh, snakehead, which was uh, developed here at the Naval Undersea Warfare Center, and that's actually floating there in Narragansett Bay. Uh, they've uh, reduced the funding significantly to this, and they're just doing experimental work with Snakehead, but we may see some more of it as well. This is a fascinating concept. This is called a sail drone. This is a sail-powered drone, and it gets underway, and it can go out for six months, 12 months at a time. It's controlled by a control center in Oakland, California, which moves the sail and the rudder as necessary to drive this item where you want it to go. So what does it do? It measures depth of water, temperature, salinity, a lot of things that anti-submarine warfare folks care about. It does a lot of work for oceanographic institutions. And there is uh, myself, once again, I love my picture. This is uh, launching a couple of sail drones from Narragansett Bay. And this is University of Rhode Island, which has operated a number of these. And they're out uh, investigating the uh, Gulf Stream and how it operates up along the coast here off, off New England. And so they uh, towed the sail drone out and turn it loose and away it goes and sends back data continuously for the extended period. And they have sailed some of these sail drones into hurricanes and have found that they've survived. So it's a uh, truly uh, remarkable capability. There's hundreds of them being built and there's bigger versions. They've got solar panels, as you can see on there, but that's to drive the electronics. That's not to drive a propulsion system, although they do have some larger ones with a uh, propulsion system built in. Maritime, now let's talk about unmanned ground vehicles. This is the PackBot, uh, which is basically a uh, improvised explosive device disposal robot. You know, traditionally, you'd see a uh, pile of trash down the road, and is that a pile of trash or is that a bomb that's been placed? And so uh, normally, you'd put an uh, EOD operator in a bomb suit, and they'd go down there, and they'd try and find out what it was, hopefully without detonating it. What they do now is they send a robot, and the robot goes down, investigate what's going on. If they say, you know, this looks like an explosive device, they can leave an explosive charge, back off with the pack bot, detonate the explosive charge, and destroy that explosive device. So very successful, save, save many, many lives. There's a version of pack bot in the uh, Future Forces Gallery you can look at. This is a uh, armed drone, ground drone. This is Mars, the, the uh, Modular Advanced Armed Robotic System. And that's Admiral Christensen, one of the past presidents when we brought the Mars here to the base. 
you know how hard it is to get on the base, right? Security can be a problem. Well, the day we said we're bringing a robot with a gun, <laughs> took a lot of talk to convince them to let it on. Well, uh, the actual one carries a, uh, uh, a machine gun, uh, it carries a uh, tear gas dispenser, a laser dazzler, a microphone and a speaker, and you can roll into an area and basically say, clear this area or we're gonna engage the target. And there is always a human being with their finger on the trigger before a decision is made to, uh, to shoot. And so that's a big issue for, uh, do we allow a robot to make a kill decision? And as time goes forward, we may very well find the situations where we need to do that. But U.S. policy is we will not do that. There will be a human in the loop. This is the uh, multi-utility tactical transporter MUT. And that trooper kind of looks like he doesn't trust it because he's pointing his gun at it. What people don't realize people in this audience I'm sure do, is that a modern uh, trooper, when he or she goes into battle, carries more weight on his or her back than a knight in shining armor used to wear when he was wearing armor. So you carry all this kit, all this gear and whatnot. We probably fly you into theater, keep you up for days, throw you out of the airplane, and then ask you to go do your job. So the question is, is there a way we could offload some of that weight to a robot of some sort that could carry a gun, could carry ammunition, could carry batteries, et cetera? And so the Marines have really been leaning forward on various aspects. This is kind of a composite picture of a number of unmanned uh, uh, ground vehicles. Some of them have wheels, some of them have tracks, some of them have, uh, uh, you know, different ways to, to get around. And uh, there are many, many designs being studied at this point. A lot of work is being done by Boston Dynamics. You may have seen Spot the Dog. Uh, which uh, was recently used by the fire department of New York when that uh, parking garage collapsed. They sent Spot in to see what they could find out. Uh, I took my class up there uh, a few months ago and we got a chance to uh, drive Spot around and whatnot. But uh, Boston Dynamics has done a tremendous amount of work in robots. This is Atlas, and if you want some fun, Google Atlas, and it is a walking robot. Now, I like to say we've all seen robots in the movies and they just walk around and they do things and they run and whatnot. That's a very difficult thing to do. Engineering the ability for a robot to walk is incredibly difficult. And so here is uh, Atlas and you can see the video. Atlas picks up that box. The guy comes over with the hockey stick and knocks it out of his hand. Atlas picks it up, he knocks it out of his hand. And you can see the robot kind of looking like, you know, when we take over, <laughs> you're the first guy we're going to find because you are not making me very happy. So this is, again, this is at Boston Dynamics, one of their bipedal robots. And there we are with uh, Spot the Dog. This is a shot of uh, uh, our class. And it's not battle bots, but it's kind of like battle bots. Uh, uh, Pre-pandemic, we used to bring the uh, robots here and we'd take them out and uh, uh, practice with them and whatnot. I'm standing there with my foot on a round robot, uh, which will roll through the ground, can get in the water and swim through the water. There are cameras on either side of the device and it can be used for surveillance. The really little ones can roll under a car and see what's going on if there's any explosives and whatnot. So uh, a lot going on there. Very briefly, driverless cars, you know, uh, the yellow in there where he gets in the back and drives, that's really not where we are in terms of driverless cars. Tesla has a driver assist module, and they're very clear about saying this is not a driverless car. And they say you must keep your hands on the steering wheel. If you don't, the car detects that and puts an alarm. Sometimes you can disable it apparently, but there have been a number of people killed in Teslas, and in one case they found that the individual was watching a video uh, and not paying attention and drove into something and killed himself. Another instance, a truck crossed the front of the, uh, of the Tesla. The device could not detect the difference between the blue sky and the blue truck. Drove right in and killed the people. So 
we're not there yet, but there will come a day when you can get in the car and say, take me to Chicago and it will get you there. But we're not there yet and you need to be uh, you know, cognizant of the fact that driverless cars still have a ways to go. This is a uh, interesting uh, civilian use of uh, aerial drones. Uh, this is uh, called the Zipline drone, and this has been used extensively in uh, Africa. Uh, roads are not always good. Rainy season roads are even worse. And so the Zipline has been used to deliver medicine, blood supplies, other things from their uh, central hub to where it needs to be. When it gets near it, it opens its bomb bay and drops the package out by parachute, goes back and gets more. So very successful. A lot of uh, similar work being done in the US, UK, and other areas. This is a design for a defibrillator. Uh, you know, it's been used to fly a defibrillator where you need it to uh, rescue people. This is a quick shot of uh, precision agriculture, which is the idea that you can use drones to inspect your crops, determine where there's uh, disease, insects, not enough water, and then you can go back and either spray with a drone or with a manned aircraft, uh, do your irrigation and whatnot. So precision agriculture is a, uh, is a huge potential field, no pun intended. Uh, this is Google Air's uh, design for a delivery robot. And so it will come and fly over your house and lower that box down and disconnect it and uh, drop off whatever it is you've ordered. Uh, a, lot of num a lot of money by a lot of companies to develop this capability. Question is, do we really want hundreds or thousands of drones buzzing around our neighborhoods? Well, how about the deconfliction with aircraft? We don't want to suck up a uh, drone and a manned aircraft engine and whatnot. So uh, I'm not sure how this is going to go, but they've been used to do everything from uh, deliver pizza and uh, burritos and whatnot. So. Uh, so, we've seen robots that fly, swim, and crawl. You want to learn more? Uh, that's my book. That happens to be me at the uh, Marina Bay Sands Hotel in Singapore, the world's largest zero-edge swimming pool, and those are my pasty white to toes, for which I apologize. So, And as we mentioned, the Chinese version, uh, the uh, Ministry of Defense of Taiwan bought the rights to the book, published 2,500 copies, distributed it to their, uh, their troops, and uh, we suspect that maybe the PLA and Navy's reading it too, but there's nothing classified in it. it uh, it's just a good overview of what goes on in the world. So with that, I will conclude, and uh, are there any questions? Yes, sir, you, use your microphone, please. Yes, I'm uh, Captain Paraskevopoulos from the Hellenic Navy. Uh, regarding the unmount, the underwater unmount uh, vehicles like the Orca, uh, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about their means of communication with the center that controls them, because I suppose that would be a limiting factor regarding their utility. Are you a, are you a submariner by chance? Yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, we can't talk to our submarines very easily when they're uh, underwater. Uh, there are ways that things can be done, but uh, the captain's exactly right. Communicating with these is uh, very difficult. And so what that does is drive you a couple directions. One is a high level of autonomy to say, here's what I want you to do, and without any further communications, do it. The other option is that you come up to periscope depth and you communicate with your command and control operation. You hate to do that because that's how you can be discovered, uh, you know, in uh, by the opponents and whatnot. But that kind of communications is uh, is, is what is necessary. So, uh, you know, people sometimes uh, throw rocks at the unmanned undersea people. They say, "Hey, look, the aviation guys can do all this stuff." And I say, "Well, yeah, you can talk to them." They're not operating at incredibly depths, crushing, crushing uh, vehicles and whatnot. You can't communicate with them. So it is one of the uh, more significant challenges is how do you do that communications? And there, there are workarounds, and one of the big issues is, is to be able to autonomously, un autonomously do a lot of what you want to do. So, other questions? David, do you have something? Well, John. Uh 
David Scoville. Uh, it makes me wonder a little bit, so currently our policy is that we, uh, all decisions regarding drones are made by human uh, uh, actors. Are we aware of any other countries that don't share the same philosophy? And then there's a follow-on question to that. Uh, that's sort of the same uh, uh, protocol. And then what about uh, the integration of AI in drones now? Is that coming? And if so, are we aware? Are we looking at programs or other countries such as China looking at that? Absolutely. Um, and share your Good questions. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the whole notion of uh, uh, do, does the rest of the world carry the same kind of ethical and uh, uh, legal uh, issues that we do, and the answer is no, they do not. Uh, you know, the Orca is a diesel electric submarine. The Chinese and the Russians are both developing reactor powered submarines. So it gives them incredible endurance, just like uh, nuclear powered submarines do. U.S. Navy is not going to allow, the U.S. government is not going to allow a nuclear reactor to wander around at sea by itself. Uh, just not going to happen. So we follow a different set of rules. Uh, we absolutely believe, you know, the, the North Koreans have a similar ground-based uh, uh, system which will fire automatically when certain conditions are met. Now, in all honesty, you know, if you look at a mine, a mine is an autonomous system that operates when certain situations, certain sensors detect a set of circumstances, it will go off, it will detonate. So it is a fully autonomous weapon system. Uh, a lot of contention with using mines and there's a lot of p countries that will not allow m mines to be able to be used. The U.S. has not signed up to all of those uh, anti-mine uh, uh, systems. So we, uh, we believe that we, we will play with the white hat and that we will keep humans in the loop except to the chance when we can no longer do it. And if you find yourself on a ship and you're using the Vulcan phalanx system and it detects a target coming in and you have three seconds to react, you do not have time for the human being to say, I don't know if I'm gonna engage this or not. So in a fully autonomous mode, that weapon system will engage as well. So it is, uh, you know, and, and the day is coming when things move even faster and that we're not gonna have. So is there gonna be a human in the loop or is there gonna be a human on the loop or is there gonna be a human outside the loop? Don't know how that'll all develop. Artificial intelligence, everybody talks about AI in every aspect and it certainly is a factor. You know, we use autonomy uh, as kind of a, uh, a form of artificial intelligence, but it's not true AI or, you know, a generalized AI where the machine is able to understand a set of rules and regulations and adjust those rules and regulations based on what it learns. So machine learning is a real challenge. And if you are trying to control an AI system and you don't know tomorrow what it's going to do because it encountered something new, that is a very, very tough situation. I had an opportunity to uh, go to a AI conference in Rome and we talked about the fact that, you know, what we need to have ideally is like the air traffic control system in the world is basically uses English as the language, the rules and regulations are followed by everyone who is going to fly. Could we have a similar set of rules for AI? Could we say, if you're gonna operate an AI system, you have to let us know what that black box does so we can know what's going on and we potentially can control it. Well, I was quickly corrected to say, well, number one, if it's a military system, we're not gonna let you look in that black box because we don't want the enemy to know what it's gonna do. If it's a commercial system, we're not gonna let you look in that black box because that's our intellectual property. That's how we're gonna make our money. So, uh, you know, tremendous, tremendous issues going on. And I think it was CBS News or ABC News, one of them it did a whole series on AI here in the last couple of weeks. And uh, it will reach every single aspect of life. And someone had said, if you wanna get rich, take any system, anything we use today, add AI to it, and you can get rich. So, uh, any questions on Zoom, or uh, are we ready to wrap up here? One question. We do have one question on Zoom, John. Throw it out. Uh, regarding unmanned surface vessels. 
Is there a concern with unmanned surface vessels uh, operating by themselves that they would come under, you know, attack from uh, pirates or other malign actors? Yeah, absolutely. And if you look at that uh, Sea Hunter and Sea Hawk, uh, there is no self-defense capability. Now, what could you do? You could have an electrified deck that if somebody steps on it, there's electricity. You could have gas that fills the control system, the engineering system. And when I, you could do a lot of different things. But at this point, you know, the, the, you're counting on international law, law of the sea, to say that's a U.S.-owned flagged vessel. No one is allowed to touch it. Uh, and we rely on that. In time of war, all bets are off, and you know you would have to be able to defend that unmanned surface ship. And if it's some huge thing that's got 100 or 200 or 1,000 missiles, you're certainly going to have to operate in a battle group that could protect it. But uh, in the near term, these things are pretty vulnerable. Uh, I think you may have seen the news. The Iranians picked up a sail drone that was being used in the MED. It's an organization called Task Force 59 that's done some marvelous work. They've had over 100 unmanned systems operating with all, many of our allies and whatnot. And the Iranians came and picked it up. And so the U.S. Uh, you know, gathered people around them, armed people around them and whatnot, let, them, let it be known that we wanted our sail drone back and they in fact uh, gave it back to us. The Chinese at one point picked up one of our uh, our uh, sea gliders and whatnot and ultimately gave it back. But, you know, international law, law of the sea says you're not supposed to do that stuff. So we'll, we'll see if that works. Any other questions? Yes, sir, one more. Sure. Um, Major Drew King, I'm an Army Field Artillery Officer. Um, so obviously the Army is very, very concerned with counter UAS. Specifically, we're seeing um, kind of the lessons learned in Nagorno-Karabakh and now, now playing out in Ukraine as well. Um, so the Army is investing in more short-range air defense capability. Um, as we kind of tackle that problem set, do you see it more as a, like a quantity issue? Because, you, you know, like we're, we're not going to be able to keep up in terms of just how cheap it is to throw drones out there, and that, that threat is going to be persistent. Russia's got one of the best air defense capabilities in the world, and, and they're getting, you know, pretty badly beaten in the air. Um, just your thoughts on kind of how the Army needs to address that problem. Yeah, quantity quantity is going to be important, and so we have to get these things to the point where they they you can afford to lose them. The thing about the uh, loyal wingman that we talked about, you know, we think that airplane is going to cost maybe ten million dollars a copy. If you lose it, okay, it's not good, but you know, it's not the end of the world and whatnot. Uh, same thing on these drones. I, I just read something before I came over here this evening and said uh, that $20,000 drone that the uh, Iranians have provided to the Russians can cost $150,000, $200,000 to shoot it down. So you're on the losing end of that proposition, you know, every day. It's, it's the same thing with Patriot missiles and whatnot. You know, how many Patriot missiles do you use to shoot a quadrotor helicopter that's coming over? So uh, I think we're going to need to come up with, uh, you know, designs that allow us to do electronic jamming, to do counter UAS, to do uh, uh, the ability to do these things in significant numbers. And it's just, it's going to be the wave of the future. And, uh, you know, the Army has, has really uh, looking very seriously at this stuff because, uh, you know, when you're there and you're large emplacement and whatnot, you're very vulnerable. And it used to be, you know, you needed an Air Force to attack a ground uh, formation. Now you don't. You know, uh, you know, terrorist groups and everybody else have uh, strapped grenades to the underside of commercially available quad rotors and, and killed troops with them and whatnot. So I know that the, uh, the Army Chief of Staff has put that as one of his highest priorities is how do we fight the counter UAS? How do we build the counter USA, UAS capability? It's time for me to stop. Okay, thank you very much for your time.